So my name's Mark Dixon and um, I live on the Essex coast, a place I'm particularly fond of. We have a coastline here of some 400 miles, it's, it's one and a half times as long as the Dutch coastline. And um, I started working in this environment and um, learned early on that 40,000 hectares have been destroyed by seawalls being put up and these once big wild wetlands have been destroyed for agricultural gain. It left us with about 4,000 acres left, that's all, in, in Essex. Uh, and I was witnessing in the 70s these areas just being washed away. And we knew that if nothing was done, then the potential was that certainly my children might be the last people to see these areas. Yeah, it was getting bad. It was getting really bad. The environment that I know, which I'm talking about, which is these sort of muddy marshes and creeks and gentle waters, which is the Essex coast. The salt marsh and the mudflat are one of the same thing. So the mudflat is the intertidal bit which contains loads of bugs, uh, very rich in, in, in proteins. The salt marsh is the vegetated bit, the green bit, the bit with these plants on. The supermarkets of the sea where hundreds of thousands of birds come to feed every winter. But they take out wave action. So you get a big storm coming on, you know, a salt marsh and a mudflat. By its nature of being almost gentle, creates these gradual slopes which can take the sting out of those waves and the sting out of those floods. Their ability, if you like, to defend built property is enormous. But they can also soak up pollutants, be it heavy metals uh, or in particularly this day and age, I guess carbons. A new salt marsh or mudflat you make can take out about three and a half tonnes of, uh, of carbon per hectare per year. That's about twice as much as the rainforest. The benefits to society of these very gentle, perhaps dull looking places is enormous. Y the first glance is, my God, you know, it's grey and then there's a bit of green on the top. Uh, so how does that work then? But you start looking at it and you realise how complex it is. And you take a human lung and you cut through it and you have all these little kind of tubes that go off and little kind of meanders and whatever you, to, to maximise getting oxygen into our blood system. And if you look at a salt marsh from above, it has exactly the same systems. So they are the lungs of the earth, they're the lungs of the sea. Because of the, the amount of nutrients they can hold, these are great areas as, as the, the fish fry nurseries. Uh, a salt marsh on its own produces one and a half tonnes of per hectare per year of fish food and dead vegetation. So what happened was in Charles I's time, the Dutch came over here at the King's Invite and drained the fens and put sea walls up. People thought they were doing the right thing, taking a useless area as far as they knew they were and making them, shall we call it, productive. You could grow food, you could have sheep meat and, and whatever, you know. So salt marshes as themselves were seen as absolutely useless. So what happened with myself is that I, I started working in, in flood defences, in, in building sea walls and this sort of stuff. and. After about 10 years, I thought, well, you know, here we are again, pouring yet more concrete, putting in more steel um, to defend these areas. And in actual fact, we are this is hugely expensive and building in floodplains. So why don't we start looking at the way that nature itself looked after this coastline long before man was here? Can we use natural systems to defend our coastline rather than just using expensive steel and concrete? I did have good support, but also a lot of anti-feeling in as much that people, um, be it a landowner or a homeowner, wants a nice big concrete seawall to defend them against the indefensible, really. So you have to, if you like, first convince that landowner that what you're going to do is correct. But when you explain to people, landowners in particular, that, you know, maintaining the seawall to protect their 500 hectares of wheat field is costing the taxpayer an absolute bloody fortune, and that in future they're going to have to pay for that themselves, well, the economics shift. We did a trial site of only half a hectare on a bit of land owned by the National Trust. We took the seawall down. Well, what happened is, I guess, is the old thing that nature doesn't like vacuums. So you, you put the salt water back on, and immediately it kind of sprang back to life. Within inside five years, all the plants were back there. Uh, and again, the, the speed with which the bugs came back in the mud was just remarkable. You know, you had this living soup coming in twice a day, flooding this land which had been sprayed to bloody death to grow crops on. And within five years, you, you couldn't tell that it had been, you know, enclosed behind a seawall for the best part of 300 years. From a financial point of view, this seawall, which had cost perhaps 10,000 pounds every, every five years to hold in place, we didn't have to worry anymore because these salt marshes and mudflats came back in and did the job for us. 
you know, it was a win-win situation. As we did more sites, it became easier because people who had concerns, you could say, well, look, here's one we made earlier. It ain't so bad, is it? And they quite liked it. So I think the layperson started to come on board. And then one day the RSPB, that's the Royal Society for Protection of Birds, came to see me and said, look, you know, we want to buy an entire island in the south of Essex, a place called Wallasey, and we want to try and um, convert it back to what it had been in 1420. This was now, you know, a, a big area. Could we restore the whole thing? A landscape style rewilding of putting back to nature in some ways, but in a way that made it immediately useful. The problem had been that the land, because it had been a wall for so long, had shrunk. And so it was all a couple of meters below sea level. We had to raise that level up before we dare let the sea back in again. A thing called Crossrail was happening in London. It's a new underground system going east to west. and had these huge tunneling machines taking out huge amounts, millions and millions of tons of, of clay and chalk and whatever. They needed continuity for their cutter heads. And so they were very interested in bringing the material around by you know, big barges and raising the, the land level back up again. It took about three years for this to, for the design to be done. Uh, and then the material was imported and the site um, was built. When it was opened, I think there was a surprise from the local community that all of a sudden on their doorstep, what they'd been used to was these big fields, which they loved, but now they could walk where they liked on these, on these paths and see just gobsmacking amounts of birds coming in. And the snakes came back and the lizards came back and the hares were happy. Yeah, you, you, you know, you're kind of walking through a landscape which had been there and you'd forgotten. I think people love it. I think since the early stages of, of that scheme, Wallacey, and some of the other schemes, there was a growing awareness of, of climate change. And certainly, I mean, on the climate change side, I've been working on that for the last over 30 years. What's got worse is we know that sea level rise is going to come. But with natural areas like salt marshes, mudflats, sand dunes, they will regenerate themselves. They'll creep up the hill as the tide rises and, and, and they'll keep reinventing themselves and, and create this gentle buffer zone around our coast to protect us from the hell which is heading our way. God knows what's going to happen. It is going to be dreadful for people unless we do something about it now. I happen to be lucky enough to have, if you like, the knowledge and the background to do something on my little bits of salt marshes. You know, we want to leave something behind for our kids, which is pretty. I grew up, sit on this coastline with lots of birds and catching eels, and it's declined terribly. But the thought of just saying, well, that's the way it is now, I don't think is acceptable to the way that we have a moral duty to our kids, et cetera, et cetera, and to the creatures that live here with us. But it's not in human nature to give up. We are creatures who are fascinated by other things. And so I stay hopeful. And if millions of people do something, well, all of a sudden you have quite a strong force there. So just spare a thought for the other creatures around you. A life is a life. Whether you're a little tiny shrew or a winkle or whatever, just respect that life. You know, you have a duty of care of these little things that can't look after themselves. You know, the birds that we try and protect or whatever with our new marshes, they don't speak English, they don't speak German or French, and if we don't speak for them, who the hell's going to then?